In December 1998, 21-year-old Lindsay Kwai went missing from a home in Stamford Road, Southport, in Merseyside, UK, leaving behind her two children and her 23-year-old husband, Mitchell Kwai. Kwai, like any concerned husband, appealed to the press for help finding his wife, but his demeanour was off-putting and highly suspicious, but he took it a step further, basically inviting the press into his life. Here is an example of one of these interviews. I didn't do that. I haven't done anything to Lindsay. I'm not capable of doing something like that. Like I say, I'm not going to sit here and start saying yes and no to stupid things, stupid questions, questions I've already answered a thousand times. And just say again, and it's not a stupid question, it's a very serious question. Did you kill Lindsay? Wait and find out. By the point of this interview, Mitchell Choir had strangled Lindsay to death, dismembered her and scattered her remains in separate areas of Southport. This man is a manipulative, remorseless monster. Welcome to Evil Among Us. Lindsay Kwai, formerly Lindsay Wilson, was born in 1977. The youngest of six children, she was described as beautiful, fun-loving, happy and a caring person by those who knew her. When she was 17 years old, she became pregnant with her first serious boyfriend, but five months into the pregnancy, they separated. Soon after this, she met Mitchell Kwai, a casino worker who promised to help her raise the child and the pair soon became inseparable. They married quickly, within five weeks of beginning their relationship. This was a warning flag which we'll return to later. In 1995, Lindsay gave birth to her first child, a daughter called Robin. And in 1997, the couple had their first child together, a son called Jack. Outwardly, everything seemed ideal. Lindsay was a young mother with two beautiful children. However, behind the scenes, in her short life, Lindsay was subjected to persistent violence and emotional abuse at the hands of her husband, a controlling, narcissistic coward who believed that he was smarter than everyone else. Heartbreakingly, after her death, a diary that Lindsay had written in since 1997 was uncovered and this showed the depths of her despair and how unhappy she was. She dedicated this book to her children and whilst we will never know, the content of the pages appears to indicate that she was leaving it for them because she feared that her own life would soon come to an end. In the diary, she wrote, quote, This book is for my kids, to let them know how hard my life was and how I tried my best to bring them up on my own and let them know how much I love them. She also wrote, quote, I hope you never have to go through anything that I had to go through. All I can say is, I've done my best. I hope it was good. One thing I've always done since the day you were born is make sure you knew I loved you to my two babies. I've read reports which indicate repeated acts of violence within the family home. A neighbour recalled one occasion when Lindsay was four months pregnant with Jack, running down the road to get away from Kwai, who had assaulted her and then proceeded to smash up the property. It's clear that Kwai, as with other domestic abuse perpetrators, was a coward, a man who felt the need to achieve and maintain control over his wife. These individuals almost always have deep-seated fears of abandonment and they feel that fear is the only way they can ensure their partner will not leave them, something they're unable to cope with. Between January 1998 and April 1998, Kwai left the family home on at least seven occasions. On the last occasion, apparently for good. This led Lindsay to write in her diary, quote, Mitch walked out, then came back. And on another occasion, she said, quote, gone, moved out again. Lastly, she wrote, quote, so this time he's gone for good, have had it with him. Rather than leaving it to the end, I wish to explain why Choir was acting in this way and give some context. One of an abuser's tools is withdrawing affection, where they withhold attention and caring in order to elicit a negative emotional response. A good example is ignoring their partner's phone calls or refusing to talk to them at home, etc., this is intended to make the victim feel worthless and agitated that, at any point, they could be abandoned, so they will often walk on eggshells, not wishing to displease their partner in case they leave them. 
This can include the perpetrator leaving the family home when they'll inevitably go to another property and sit there imagining how upset their partner must be. However, this is all a facade. These people are often emotionally dependent on the relationship and simply want the attention and the negative response. They want to see how devastated their victim is by their actions. They want them begging for them to come home because this makes them feel powerful and dominant in the relationship. Of course, as with all domestic abuse perpetrators, it's one rule for them and one rule for the victim. Of course, they feel they should be allowed to simply come and go from the relationship as they please. But if the victim tries to leave at any point, then God help them. Unfortunately, this was the case with Lindsay. In the summer of 1998, Lindsay was apparently free of Kwai and found a new home for herself and the children in Stamford Road. She managed to obtain this with the help of Women's Aid, an organisation that helps victims of domestic abuse. Lindsay was so afraid of Kwai and what he might do to her that she was given a public protection alarm which she could activate and the police would descend on the property. However, soon after moving into her new home, Kwai started worming his way back in. Remember, this was never actually about leaving the relationship. He wanted her to see how important he was to her by withdrawing his affection. However, I think that he saw that Lindsay was doing things on her own, moving on with her life, and he couldn't allow this, and he needed to be back in order to control her. Kwai was living with his wife and the two children in December 1998. On December the 15th, 1998, Lindsay was seen alive for the last time. She then disappeared. Despite Lindsay going missing in December 1998, her loving husband did not report her missing straight away. In fact, he never reported her missing at all. It was only in February 1999, over 50 days since her disappearance, that a concerned social worker for the children raised the alarm due to not having seen Lindsay for some time. When the police eventually spoke to Kwai, he had no explanation as to why he'd never reported his wife missing, with him claiming that he just assumed that she'd up and left one day. Whilst Lindsay may have left him, the police struggled to believe that she would have left her two children without a word before Christmas. Lindsay's family also could not believe it, and they knew Kwai was lying. They had no doubt that Kwai had hurt Lindsay, but it was a case of proving it. However, Kwai, being the narcissist that he is, couldn't simply put his head down and get on with his life. Instead, he craved the media's attention. He went on morning television to make an appeal for his wife and even invited journalists and a documentary film crew to follow him around. Everyone who came into contact with Kwai was suspicious. He seemed to show no negative emotions when talking about the disappearance of his wife, the mother of his children, and instead seemed jovial, without a care in the world, with him later being dubbed the, quote, smiling killer. Kwai obviously thought he was very clever, but the police knew almost immediately that he was the killer. Remember, the police had information which was not available to the public, including calls to 999 about the various reports of domestic violence that Lindsay had been subjected to. They'd also spoken to her friends and family, all of whom pointed the finger directly at Kwai. In early February 1999, Kwai made a claim that he'd seen Lindsay locally in a market and in a BMW being driven along. The police checked and found no evidence of this. However, what they did uncover was that since his wife's disappearance, Kwai had been forging her signature in a benefits book so he could withdraw her money. On February the 27th, 1999, he was arrested on suspicion of murder and fraud. The police didn't have enough evidence to charge Kwai with murder, but charged him with fraud and he was convicted and given community service. I think the police were trying to psychologically intimidate Kwai, showing him they knew he had done it and were not going away and that it was only a matter of time. A terrible part of this story is Lindsay's family having to continue to interact with Kwai on a regular basis because of the grandchildren. For 18 months, Lindsay's parents, including her father Peter Wilson, who made his feelings about Kwai clear, had to knock on the door of the man they knew killed their daughter at the home where she'd likely been murdered in order to collect the grandchildren. Kwai claimed that when the truth was revealed and he was exonerated, that Peter would owe him an apology. Kwai was reveling in the attention he was getting and using any opportunity to spin his web of lies, trying to portray himself as the victim, the concerned husband who had been abandoned by his wife, who was being persecuted by society. This clip shows Mitchell Kwai, the victim, 
Knowing that he killed Lindsay makes each and every one of these interactions so sickening. Any idea what I felt like when this first began? People accusing me, well not accusing me, but saying things in the newspapers about that. People talking about me, people thinking I killed me. Do you have any idea what it felt like? How much, how much I had to, how many times I've walked out my front door and how many times I've had to, I've thought to myself, I just can't, I don't want to walk out there with people looking at me, thinking I've done something like that to my wife. However, the attention always had to be on Quire's terms, and after a year of being in the spotlight, Quire was apparently sick of all the attention, and so gave an interview, which was published in the papers, stating he no longer wanted the attention of the press. So, you have a man being followed around by a documentary film crew, who is so sick of the media attention, that he had to go to the papers to tell them to stop publishing stories about him. Clearly, the opposite is true. I believe that, after 12 months, Quai was not getting the attention he was craving and so had to reignite attention by claiming that he didn't want any further press coverage. I'm sure he was hoping that by saying don't look at me people would be more fascinated and feel compelled to pay him more attention. Quai's particular nemesis in the police was Detective Superintendent Jeff Sloan who stated quote he almost goaded me by going to the media I just felt he was an egotist in exploiting the situation he started to revel in his own notoriety. Quire would antagonise the police, including sending D.S. Sloan a Christmas card with a bottle of hair dye with a note stating he should, quote, get rid of the grey bits to have more confidence. We're all human beings, and if someone pisses us off, we naturally will expel more energy to try and bring that person down if we know they are ultimately in the wrong. Antagonising a senior police officer who knows your secret and who has the whole weight of the police force behind them is not a smart move. This shows the complete delusion and narcissism of Mitchell Kwai, believing he was so clever that he could stick two fingers up at the authorities and they would not come after him. He was wrong. The walls were closing in on Kwai and this clip appears to be his last interview before his downfall, where again, he is the victim and he wishes the viewer to see that front and centre. You see stuff like this happening to people on the telly, like people doing press conferences and shit like that. When you just look at it and you look at it and you think, oh God, that's pretty sad, isn't it? And you just move on, turn over and watch Coronation Street, put neighbours on. But when you actually have to live it, you never stop thinking about it. It's with you 24 hours a day. You even dream about it. Sometimes you think to yourself, are you going to pinch yourself and wake up? It's all a bit of a bad dream, but it ain't. It ain't. The police have been working on this case for 18 months, convinced that Lindsay was dead, and although they didn't have a body, they were able to show there'd been no activity on her bank accounts, she had not kept any of her appointments, and no one, aside from her husband, had apparently seen her since December 1998. In addition to this, they had records of his apparent violent behaviour towards her, and statements from her friends and family that outlined the same. They also had nothing from their inquiries which would give any indication that Lindsay would have ever left her children. In addition, the police found out that, on the day she was last seen alive, the 15th of December 1998, Lindsay had spoken to friends about meeting with a solicitor, to finally divorce her husband. There was likely more information the police had, but I cannot find specific reference to it. I do know that they searched the family home, so potentially they found forensic evidence. Regardless, on the 7th of June 2000, 18 months after Lindsay went missing, Mitchell Quire was arrested on suspicion of murder. He gave no information during interview, but this didn't matter. The circumstantial case was enough to charge him with the murder of his wife, Lindsay. However, being charged seemed to open the floodgates and Mitchell Kwai confessed to killing his wife. Based on his confession and evidence collected by the police, they were able to determine what had become of Lindsay Kwai. Specifically, it appears that in the early hours of December 16th, 1998, Lindsay informed Kwai that she was leaving him. They had an argument, and Kwai grabbed Lindsay round the neck and strangled her to death on the living room floor. 
This was while both children were in the house, likely asleep in their beds. Afterwards, Quiet placed Lindsay's body in their bedroom and closed the door, placing towels at the foot of the door to stop the smell of decomposition. How long Lindsay remained in the bedroom is unclear, but it's apparent that Kwai carried on as if everything was normal, taking the children to school, feeding them, and playing with them in the house where their mother was lying dead. However, Kwai knew that he needed to dispose of Lindsay, and employed the help of his brother, Elliot Kwai, aged 22 years old at the time, and who was employed as a butcher. Within the bathroom, the Kwai brothers cut up Lindsay's body, removing her arms and legs, as well as her head and hands. Her body parts were then deposited around various sites in Southport, with her torso being dumped near a roller coaster at Southport Pleasureland. Her arms and legs were found dumped in a bush near a railway line. Her head and hands were disposed of in a landfill, but unfortunately were never recovered by the police. On June the 9th, 2000, Kwai agreed to show the police where Lindsay's remains had been deposited, as shown by this clip which demonstrates his lack of remorse for his actions and a lack of concern for his wife and his continued need for attention. The following day, we followed Mitchell and the police on a horrifying tour to find Lindsay's remains. What I was hoping for, that he wasn't taking us on a wild goose chase and just seeking more publicity. I was amazed, he, he, he looked around and, and asked if the press were there because he was quite eager to be seen on camera. He was laughing and joking with the officers, no remorse whatsoever. These are the grim scenes of Mitchell Kwai revealing to the police the whereabouts of his wife Lindsay's broken body. He pointed to an area and said that he'd put the carcass, he referred to Lindsay's torso as the carcass. On the 16th of January 2001, Mitchell Quay appeared for sentence at Liverpool Crown Court before Justice Brian Leveson QC, having pled guilty to the murder of Lindsay Quay. This was clearly a calculated move by Quay, as he'd agreed to plead guilty to manslaughter I admitting that he killed Lindsay, but claiming that it was an accident. However, this was rejected. I have no doubt his guilty plea was to get some credit from the court for his sentencing. Justice Leveson described Kwai as, quote, an evil cynic, and stated, quote, You killed your wife as long ago as December the 16th, 1998, in circumstances which I accept were not premeditated. What followed, however, was very different. Over the next 18 months, you embarked on a deception of breathtaking cynicism, appearing on the television and radio, bemoaning your wife's absence and castigating police for directing their attention towards you. He then sentenced him. Mitchell Kwai was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 17 years for the murder of his wife, Lindsay. His brother, Elliot Kwai, was sentenced to seven years for dismembering and helping to dispose of Lindsay's remains. Mitchell Kwai appeared to show no remorse for his behaviour whilst he was in prison and was still obsessed with himself. Psychiatric nurse Chris Keneally worked at the same prison as Kwai and stated that he was, quote, one of the most unpleasant psychopaths he'd ever met. Chris stated that Kwai would become excited when his image appeared on television and would ask staff whether they'd seen his various appearances. Chris said, quote, he seemed very disappointed. He expected that everyone in the prison would now recognise his star status and he also expected to be treated as a celebrity that he felt he was. He was very upset that this did not happen. Kwai first became eligible for parole in 2017 and this was denied. Lindsay's daughter Robin released a statement after this decision which read, quote, It makes me feel a lot safer knowing he won't be getting out and it's a little bit of justice for my mum, although nothing that ever happens will be enough justice. There's not much more to say other than we are happy we can relax for a while and not constantly have it at the back of our minds. Kwai again applied for parole in May 2022, but this was again refused by the parole board, who had ongoing concerns about his risk and him taking drugs in prison. The decision letter from the parole board stated, 
Some concerns have also emerged about his conduct in relationships with friends, professional staff and other prisoners. Reports gave examples of instances where he had acted on grievances and been aggressive towards others. There were also some concerns about his involvement with drugs in the prison. Professional staff have identified the need for further interventions to address Mr Quai's risk in relationships and the risk of violence if he became preoccupied with a specific problem, struggled to deal with it, and still lacked the capacity to be in full control of his emotions. So, Mitchell Kwai, now aged in his mid-40s, remains in prison, having served 22 years so far. The knockback from the parole board in 2022 means he's likely to have another hearing in 2024. The outcome of this hearing will inevitably be publicised, but it seems that the parole board still have significant concerns about this man and his risk of violence, so he's likely years from release. I keep returning to the issue of domestic abuse, and I make no apology for this, as it's insidious and one of the worst types of offences I've come across, given how underreported it is, its persistence, the profound psychological and emotional impact it has on its victims, but also the often fatal consequences of this type of behaviour. As I've said in a previous video, two women a week in the UK are murdered, either by a partner or a former partner. This is over 100 a year. In the US, this number is around 70 a month, so approximately 840 women a year, which is a staggering number. This is not to forget men who are killed by their female partners, but the opposite dynamic is obviously more common. During each of these videos on domestic abuse perpetrators, I hope to give a little more insight and understanding to their behaviours, warning signs, and also give advice. With regards to the template I've spoken about before, domestic abuse perpetrators almost always have significant issues with abandonment and self-esteem, with them feeling that, because of how they perceive themselves, they will inevitably be abandoned, something they cannot cope with, and so they seek to control their partner to ensure that this does not happen. This includes physical and non-physical actions which are used to gain and maintain control over their victim. A common exhibited behaviour is violence, with this being used to put the victim in fear if they defy the perpetrator's authority, demonstrating to them who is in charge, making them feel powerful. However, there are also emotional and psychological methods, and this includes as already stated in the case of Mitchell Kwai, withdrawing affection, which can include ignoring the victim, threatening to leave them, or actually leaving them. This is intended to cause the victim emotional distress by making them feel abandoned, and therefore, when this affection is given, it's usually with certain conditions, with the victim having to act in a certain way. This, though, is just a pantomime. The perpetrator relies on the relationship, and everything they do is to make sure they are not abandoned. There is an horrific hypocrisy in the behaviour of domestic abuse perpetrators. They feel they can act in any manner they want, but if their victim does anything they don't like, even something they themselves have done, they will be punished. In the case of Kwai, even though he'd repeatedly left the family home and abandoned Lindsay and the children, when she dared to try and divorce him, he would not accept this, and I've no doubt he killed her as a way to exert ultimate control over her by taking her life, ensuring that she would not leave him and be with anyone else. Domestic abuse perpetrators tend to consider their victims as objects, which they can use any way they want. This is not to say they don't care about them on some level, but their needs and wants take priority. However, Mitchell Choir is not one of these people. He's clearly a man who saw Lindsay as nothing more than his possession, with him referring to her body as a, quote, carcass. In addition, his demeanour through all the interviews is not that of a grieving husband. He's smiling and joking. He has no empathy or concern for what he's done, including the fact that he's robbed two children of a mother. Mitchell Choir is clearly a predator. I think this was shown initially in the relationship with Lindsay, which brings us to our first learning point. Specifically, domestic abuse perpetrators will often form relationships with people who they believe are vulnerable in some way, and therefore more easy to manipulate and control. With Lindsay, she was very young, aged only 17, five months pregnant, and a partner had just broken up with her. I believe that Kwai saw an opportunity and swooped in like a knight in shining armour, apparently saving Lindsay from having to go through raising a child on her own. 
They got married in five weeks. And this is a massive warning sign. Domestic abuse perpetrators will often progress relationships extremely quickly in order to make it more difficult for their victim to leave and also to place themselves in a position where they can more easily control them. This can include moving in with a partner quickly, getting them pregnant quickly, as well as getting engaged or married soon after the relationship has started. All of these tactics, in the perpetrator's mind, strengthens the link between the pair, with them believing that if they're living together, or a man and wife, or have children together, their abuse is more likely to be tolerated, and their victim will not be able to extricate themselves quickly from the situation. Unfortunately, it is all too common for perpetrators to use these same things to maintain control and punish their victim if the relationship does come to an end, including using child contact to monitor their former partner and potentially turning the children against their mother. Mitchell Quire's complete lack of regard for anyone but himself is not only shown by the murder, but his behaviour afterwards. It's clear that he filled the deep, dark hole of insecurity inside of him by using the media to get himself attention. There was no concern about being caught, but instead it was about manipulating others to give him sympathy. Poor little Mitchell. Your wife has gone missing, but of course you are the real victim. The fact that this need for attention extended to him wanting the media to see him whilst he was directing the police to his wife's remains, in my opinion, is indicative of his underlying psychopathy, with him having no conscience, no remorse. It's clear that Mitchell Quire wanted attention whatever way he could, Whether this was as the innocent persecuted victim or the vicious cold-blooded killer, it was all the same to him. Perhaps this cold lack of any sort of conscience is what the parole board detected and which is stopping him from being released. However, regardless, the end of this video should not be about Mitchell Kwai. It should be about the beautiful young woman whose life he cruelly snatched away and the two children had to grow up without their mother. It's also about Lindsay's family, who had to wait so long for justice for their daughter, and, given the condition of her body, were not able to say goodbye properly. In a heartbreaking postscript, Lindsay's brother, Peter Wilson, committed suicide soon after Kwai's imprisonment in 2001. He was just 24 years old. The coroner's inquest showed that he'd taken his life because he struggled to come to terms with the death of his sister, and was unable to process his grief. I hope both he and Lindsay are at peace, and that the family, including her children, have been able to move on from the horror inflicted on them. So, what are your thoughts on this case? Do any of you remember the murder of Lindsay Kwai? I want to thank you for watching. Please like, share and subscribe. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.